Um, when exactly was it published? I think it was published in 1940. But um, this book was published, Black Metropolis. It was the first sociological study done on African Americans. And it was done by two African Americans, St. Clair Drake and Horace R. Caton. Um, they were both professors, actually. One of sociology and one of them sort of was a professor that also dabbled in journalism, stuff like that. And they did an incredibly sort of comprehensive look at black life and really like tried to categorize everything in it. I'm actually going to pass it around in a few minutes. I bookmarked, bookmarked a bunch of like graphs that will clarify a lot of things I talk about. But um, for one thing, they invented the concept of the job ceiling. And they had the first data that sort of backed up its existence. And they sort of, in trying to break down African American life in Chicago, they they had all sorts of different ways of measuring it. They examined the religious life, they examined the class structure, they sort of, they broke, They had this idea of sort of five main axes around which black life in Chicago sort of rotated, and they were, I believe, the way they phrased them is staying alive, getting ahead, advancing the race, uh, ah, praising God, and having a good time. And these were sort of the ideas of like the five central things that no matter what class you were, some number of them were sort of the main, the, where most of your energies were directed as a person. And now I'm going to sort of move from the more general history to the more specific because the area that I've sort of specialized in is like political organ, sorry, political organizations like interaction with the criminal world because they sort of merge into each other over the period that I'm talking about. So um, I'll start with the class structure. Basically you have the three main classes that you have everywhere. The upper class, the middle class, the lower class, and their analysis of each of those, like, it is very interesting and is worth an entire separate lecture, but I'm mostly going to talk about the fourth category, which were the upper shadies, as he called them, which is an excellent name. They were the sort of wannabe upper class. They were the kind of, you could call them nouveau riche if you wanted to. Basically, they were the policy kings. They were the sort of the gangsters, kind of. Policy is basically the lottery before it was legal. Like, it's a very old game. It started in maybe 17th century, maybe earlier Europe. But the way it really comes into Chicago's story is a guy named Policy Sam migrated up from the south to Chicago with one of the earlier waves. And he started the first set of policy wheels in Chicago. And he really got the whole gambling game off the ground. And it became completely pervasive in African American culture. Like, the upper class didn't really play. But the middle class and definitely the lower class, like, played constantly. Like, it had a huge culture around it. It's probably bigger than the lotteries today. Like, it was sort of the main form of gambling on the south side. And the policy kings were absurdly rich. Like, incredibly mink coat, like, you know, throwing money out the window, champagne drinking, incredibly rich. Even though they were still stuck, basically, in the ghetto, like everyone else. And they, they, they also sometimes, like... They served an interesting role in the community. Like, they were frowned upon by some of the upper class, but mostly they were accepted. They were a little bit edgy, but essentially they were regarded as somewhat legitimate because even though Bronzeville did provide sort of alternate opportunities for employment, it didn't... There was still a, a limit to what they could get out of it, and people tended to see, like, any attempt to get ahead that wasn't overtly hurting people as legitimate. It, it was hard to make a living. These guys had done it. Go them. And they, now the reason they sort of managed to exist at all was actually because they managed to cut a deal with Al Capone. Al Capone basically ended up having a talk with sort of some of the major policy kings reasonably early in his career during Prohibition and said, you stay out of bootlegging, I'll stay out of policy. Deal, deal. And it worked. It worked out fine. They coexisted very easily. Everything went great. Al Capone actually was very well liked in the African American community. He sponsored a lot of famous jazz musicians, hung out at the clubs, was... They got along. It worked out well. It didn't really last. Um, this one schmuck of a policy king, he was... His name was, like... Edward, ah, yes, Edward Jones. Ended up in jail for something separate. Like, all the policy kings were fairly influential. They didn't go to jail very often. They, Most of the sort of very few black politicians there were depended on the policy kings to turn out the vote, but... Somehow this guy got in jail. I don't actually remember how. And his cellmate ended up being a guy named Sam Giacana, or Giacca, I have trouble pronouncing the name. But, and he, was, he worked for the Italian mob. It was kind of a psychopath, actually. 
But he was a clever psychopath, and he decided to make friends with the incredibly rich, bragging man. And he sort of, like, served as one of those, like, footman kiss-up types. Like, he got him stuff and was nice to him, and in return, Jones just blabbered the whole time about how rich he was and how awesome his life it was, and how policy worked. He explained everything. Like, he explained the ways that you sort of kept, like, kept popular numbers from coming up so you didn't have to pay out. He explained, like how they ran it, who they paid off, everything. And worse than that, when they both finally got out, in gratitude he set Sam up with his own policy wheel under him. For a while this one's okay. Eventually Sam went to the Italian... Hmm? Sorry? Exactly the policy. Oh, sorry. It's basically the lottery. Like, it works almost exactly the same way. They have a bin, there's a bunch of balls with numbers in it. Um, you spin it, the numbers come up, that number gets the payoff of the whole pot. It's it's basically the exact same thing. It's just what they called it when it was illegal. Exactly how does one do the popular numbers from coming up? Do you just mm -hmm. not put it in the pot? Do you put them like that? Sort of. They actually have a way of basically like making the popular numbers popular. There were a lot of was a lot of superstition associated with the game, mm -hmm. and there would be all these like sort of fortune teller types or like just good gamblers who would give out like. They had all these little booklets that would give you like numerological things, like you could like code in your birthday and the sign would spit out a number that was like that plus the day that your father died or something and like that was your lucky number, you know? Like stuff like that. So the policy kings would go find someone who was relatively popular and putting out these booklets and they basically give them a set of numbers. Those guys would push those numbers and then they'd make sure that number didn't come up. Stuff like that. And a lot of it got a lot more intricate than that, but that's sort of the easiest one that I can remember. Oh, yeah. Um, sure, no, prohibition, booze is illegal, everyone is sad. So bootlegging is making alcohol, and when we, I say making alcohol, I don't mean making white lightning that, like, rusts your brain cells. I mean making, like, decent alcohol, selling it, running speakeasies. And the Italian mob had control of that, and Bronzeville didn't want it anyway. Also smuggling alcohol. That, too. So, yeah, like... That was working out pretty well, but Al Capone, we all know how that went. Elliot Ness, jail, taxes, bad. <laughs> and and uh, good old Sam went to the mob and said, basically, I can give you the policy game in Chicago. I know how to run it. We don't need them. And we can take it. And the mob was like, yeah, that sounds great. Because it's really one of the bigger like money-making sources in Chicago at this point. Um, and so the mob wages a sort of slow war, for lack of a better word, against the policy kings, and epic story, very epic. Most of the policy kings get kidnapped, killed, scared off, all that jazz. Jones runs away to Mexico, and doesn't get in any more trouble. It, it's unfortunate. Um, and at the same time, the mayor of Chicago, Kennelly, I don't remember his first name, but Mayor Kennelly, decides that he's going to have a crackdown on the policy game in Chicago. But he only cracks down on the black policy wheels, not the white ones. So the city government is wiping out the policy racket at the same time that the mob is wiping out the policy kings. And this very excellent guy named Theodore Rowe holds out until, like, the mid-40s. He's, he, like, one, he, they try to kidnap him numbers of times, and he, like, knocks out the guy who, you know, tries to drag him to the car and, like, runs away, and, like, he's, you know, refuses to leave. And he, he does a great job of trying to hold out on his own, but they eventually murder him. And <laughs> so they're basically... African-American run crime in Chicago is gone. There are, like, there's still African-Americans working for the wheels. There's some of them working for the mob, because the mob is racist like everyone else, but not as racist as most of the other sort of ethnic gangs. Like, they employ African-Americans. They <coughs> work with them and stuff. But, like, none of them have real positions of power. They're, they're all officially street low-level guys now. And this coincides with another thing that really basically makes African-American life in Chicago, like, Somewhat like it is today. Like, obviously the modern era has changed a little, but it sort of, it makes it more into something that we can recognize. African-Americans